Dr. Behe, please tell us what is your field of expertise and where did you get your PhD? I'm a biochemist and biochemistry is the science that studies the molecules of life, the very foundation of life. And I got my PhD in biochemistry at the University of Pennsylvania in 1978. Uh, my dissertation looked at sickle cell hemoglobin and how it helps to cause the disease sickle cell anemia. And at what point did you become a Darwin skeptic? I know that evolution is one of those topics that you're forbidden to question. You're just, you're told to accept. And in the field of academia especially. So how did you start to question Darwinism? Uh, yeah, that, that's interesting. I was always taught that Darwin was right. He, I went to parochial schools and heard about it there in high school and college, of course, and I never had any problem with it. I figured that the uh, Catholicism is, could live with Darwin's theory of evolution, but it w wasn't until I was an associate professor at Lehigh University in the mid-1980s that I read a book called Evolution, A Theory in Crisis by a man named Michael Denton, who was a geneticist and medical doctor living in Australia. And he pointed out a whole lot of problems for Darwin's theory that I had never heard of, even though I was a, you know, a professor of biochemistry. I'm supposed to know these things. And I, at that point, I became mad, angry, because I thought I was being led to believe something, not because of the evidence, but because that's just the way we're supposed to think these days. And so from then on, I became very interested in evolution. My previous research was not on evolution, it was on other things, but now I, I became interested in it. And I, uh, one of the first things I did was to go to the science library and see who had explained some of the many uh, very complex biochemical systems that you routinely study in biochemistry. The foundation of life is, is very complex, very elegant. I would look at it sometimes uh, before reading this book and say to myself, gee, wow, I wonder how that evolved. And then I'd say, well, somebody probably knows, and I'd, I'd turn the page. <laughs> but then I said, well, who has explained this? And I was astonished to see there are no papers in the science literature detailing in, in real terms how some of the very complex systems of life uh, could have arisen by a Darwinian mechanism. And that's when I became very skeptical of Darwin's theory. Can you please uh, dig a little bit deeper into what you mean by complexity? I know that in some of your writings you illustrate your point with the mousetrap. Um, mm -hmm. And I have one here. <laughs> so how does this little contraption make your point? Okay, well, uh, this mousetrap, as you can see, is complex in the sense that it has a number of different parts. And what's more, in order to perform its function, in order to catch mice, it needs all these guys. It needs all these parts. It's got this uh, wooden platform, and it's got the spring here, and the spring has extended ends. It's not just a simple spring, it's got its end that hooks over this part, which is called the hammer, which is this part that actually catches the mouse. And it's got another extended end here to press against the platform. And uh, it's got uh, this extended uh, thing that's called the holding bar, and that can, and that can hold the uh, hammer this part in uh, place until the mouse comes along. And there's a little thing called the catch here, uh, which stabilizes the holding bar. Now, it turns out, if any of these parts are missing, the trap doesn't work. So not only is it complex, it's what I called irreducibly complex. You can't take a part away and still have it work. If you took away this hammer, you know, the mice don't get caught, take away the spring or the holding bar, any of the pieces, it doesn't work. Now the problem for Darwin's theory is, is that, number one, the molecular foundation of life 
is, is run by machines. The cell is run by actual machines made out of molecules. People <laughs> find that fantastic, but hey, that's, that's the way it is. There are little machines that act like uh, outboard motors that can propel cells along and other machines that carry cargo from one part of a cell to another. And those machines, just like pretty much any machine, and including the mousetrap, have a number of different parts performing different roles, and they're all needed for the machine to work. Darwin's theory of uh, evolution requires that natural selection uh, favor an organism that has a very small change that helps the organism do something better. So if we're taking that view of Darwinism, we can ask how could something like this, something like a mousetrap, be put together one tiny step at a time? And it turns out <laughs> it's surprisingly difficult. You, you know, if you just had the wooden platform, just the bottom, that doesn't catch mice. If you put on, say, this, this holding bar, you might say, well, maybe if a mouse is running along, it would trip on the platform and impale itself on the holding bar. <laughs> but that's, that's kind of just silly. Uh, so this can't be made gradually. So that's a big problem for Darwin's theory because pretty much the foundation of life these things are, are all over the place. And furthermore, you can ask yourself, well, how do we recognize intelligence? And it turns out that the way that we recognize intelligence is by what I called a purposeful arrangement of parts. And that's when different parts are put up in relationship to each other, where you can see that they have a purpose. That is, the arrangement has a purpose. An easy example are letters in a word. You know, people put the letters in to form a word, words to make a sentence and so on. And not only is this arrangement, uh, this can't be put together gradually, but we immediately see that the arrangement of these parts has a purpose. And so we immediately grasp the intelligence that was needed to produce something like this. And again, I can't emphasize enough that Darwin didn't know anything about the foundation of life. He and his contemporaries thought that the cell was a little piece of jello, protoplasm, they'd call it. And it was mysterious, you know, did cool stuff, but they didn't know how, so they pretty much ignored it. But uh, modern science has shown that it's, the cell is a lot like a ultra-sophisticated nanoscale factory, far, far beyond anything that humans could produce. And again, they're, they're just chock full of machinery that are, is much more sophisticated than this simple little mousetrap. So, um, so not only have I become skeptical of Darwin, but you know, uh, you can readily see the design in life. So uh, I've argued that, that uh, many of these machines were purposefully designed. It's a compelling argument for sure, especially when we observe in, in, uh, in daily life, uh, when we see something that was made, the first thing that comes to mind is it had to have had a maker. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were walking through the, the Amazon jungle and you saw a bicycle, you would automatically think, well, who left this bicycle here? Right. Or how did it get here? That's like William Paley's uh, in around the year 1800. He's made a famous argument called the watchmaker argument, saying that if you found a, a pocket watch in a meadow as you were walking along, you would immediately know that it was purposely designed because you see how the parts interact with each other, uh, the gears and then the uh, hands of the watch and so on. And so when we see that purposeful arrangement of parts, we always perceive that there is a mind behind it because only minds have purposes. And you don't even have to go to uh, things like watches and bicycles. Uh, when I go out and talk to groups, I show a Far Side cartoon. 
it's a good cartoon series, uh, very amusing. And there's one that shows a bunch of jungle explorers, a line of drunk jungle explorers. And the lead explorer has been pulled up by a vine by his ankle and all these kind of bamboo shoots come and you know skewer him and one of the one of the other explorers says to a third one that that's why i never walk in front and <laughs> good advice uh, but the point is that anybody uh in the audience sees that the trap was purposely made because you need the parts to be arranged just so uh, for it to work. And that, that wasn't an accident. As a matter of fact, the humor of the cartoon depends on the audience recognizing the design. So, um, so again, that's, that's how we recognize design and intelligence in a mind. And we see that everywhere in life, especially at its foundation. What you're saying suggests that it takes too much faith to believe in Darwin, that the universe and the order that we can see mm -hmm. in all these things at, at a very basic level presupposes order right? Mm -hmm. and presupposes a mind that, that made that order, created that order. And to think that Darwin with just unguided, unplanned processes, you know, explains everything is, it takes too much faith. Yeah, you, you can put it that way, um, and certainly a lot of people, it is a real matter of faith. That is, that they posit or they believe and will not be uh, talked out of the, uh, the assumption that there is nothing that could have made life on Earth or that could have arranged the universe, the laws of the universe, and so, so therefore, it, Clearly, it had to have happened by chance or, uh, or, or such, or by a process such as Darwin's, because here we are, you know, and, <laughs> and Darwin's is the only theory that's ever been advanced that has any shot at explaining uh, such things as life. But uh, you can be open, you don't have to take Darwin's theory as a matter of faith or design as a matter of faith. You could say, well, what does the evidence show? And I think back in Darwin's day, they didn't know much about life and the, his idea was reasonable. And, you know, it, it was a good start. You know, it was always, a, um, you know, a long shot, but hey, you know, try it and see how far you can get. And, um, it certainly does explain some things, Darwin's theory. Uh, for example, I said that my uh, doctoral thesis was work on sickle hemoglobin. Well, it turns out sickle hemoglobin is a, a mutant of normal hemoglobin. And while it causes anemia in most people, in Africa, folks that have a mix of the sickle hemoglobin and normal hemoglobin genes, one from their mom, one from their dad, have a measure of immunity to malaria. So that helps. And you can explain that by a classic Darwinian mechanism. But the problem is it's just a tiny change in a pre-existing system, hemoglobin. And much more often, what you see is that the mutations that are selected by a Darwinian process are ones that break genes, ones, genes that were already there. There are other malaria mutations that have been selected. One is called thalassemia, where the gene for one of the strands of hemoglobin is broken so that it doesn't produce normal hemoglobin in the blood. And for some reason that nobody quite understands, that gives a degree of immunity to malaria. And another one uh, breaks a gene called glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. <laughs> and uh, again, nobody knows why that helps, but it does somehow affecting the interior of the red blood cell where the malarial parasite lives when it invades a human. So you had to advance science far enough 
to be able to understand what was happening. Back in Darwin's day, people would see that uh, some natives of countries that had malaria had this wonderful resistance to the disease. And European uh, explorers would go in and drop like flies because they'd get malaria and die. So you'd say, hey, you know, this is marvelous. But they didn't understand what was going on. And uh, it's only been surprisingly recently, in the past 20 years or so, since the turn of the millennium, that science has been able to look at the mutations, the changes in DNA that are needed for many of these classic uh, helpful mutations. Uh, and you have to do that because it turns out a mutation is a change in a molecule, a change in DNA or in the proteins, the mach molecular machinery that the DNA codes for. And again, Surprisingly, many of the beneficial mutations that people have pointed to have turned out to be degradative mutations, ones that break or degrade the pre-existing genetic information uh, that was there. And what's more, we've uh, discovered since the 1950s that the cell is run by molecular machines, really complex, intricate things that have all these elegant controls and mechanisms and, and so forth. The, the genetic code, code is of course always associated with information and a mind. Um, so in recent years, modern science has provided the data that shows that a mind, an intelligent agent, uh, was behind life. You know, there certainly can still be accidents and things like the sickle hemoglobin mutation, but you know, 99.999% uh, of life would have required purposeful uh, planning, purposeful, intelligent uh, design. You use the word elegant, and that, that's intriguing. How have your studies brought you closer to understanding the uh, grandeur of God and his creation? Uh, well, that, uh, that's a, a good uh, question, and as I mentioned earlier, I went to parochial school and I went to uh, Catholic high school, and I've always, I was raised in a Catholic family and I've always believed in God, but I was taught Darwin's theory in, um, in grade school and then in high school too. And we were all we was taught a kind of a theistic evolutionary type of understanding of life that, well, God made the laws of the universe and knew that they would give rise to folks like us. And, you know, that's, that's our best understanding of, the, of uh, how life arose from science. Uh, nonetheless, if God cr wants to create us through secondary causes versus primary or something, you know, who are we to say otherwise? And, that always sounded just fine to me, you know. I, <laughs> no theologian, and uh, so it sounded good to me. And and so I have always, you know, uh, been a practicing Catholic. I've uh, always seen the uh, very the force of philosophical and other arguments for God. Uh, but <laughs> as you might imagine, when you see uh, something called a bacterial flagellum, which is a literal outboard motor that bacteria use to swim. If you read about things like the photosynthetic reaction center in plants, where there are these enormously complex uh, systems to take a photon of light and capture the energy in it, and it's like a bucket brigade where, you know, the first the first step is to send an electron from one carrier to another carrier and from there to another and there are protons acid which is pumped out as the result of the and it's, you know it's it is really it's marvelous exactly a marvelous system and when you find out that the great majority of hype behind darwin's theory was uh, pretty much a potemkin village uh, that uh, everybody assumed that, but nobody had any evidence. And so you go back and see that all of this stuff required planning to an extreme degree. 
you know, when that <laughs> starts to bring home to you the wisdom and power and majesty of God, and that God is interested or re responsible for details of life and presumably much else that you didn't even know were there, and probably ones that you still don't know are there or <laughs> have been planned by Him uh, and brought to fruition by him. So, yeah, it, 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 <laughs> it, it certainly affects your understanding of God. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you to help uh, college students who may be entering the classroom for the first time and, uh, or uh, in, in a classroom setting where they're taught Darwin and they're not exactly sure what to say. What would be your recommendation for them? Like, uh, what would be a good way for them to show that they're not sold on Darwinian evolution, and how would you suggest they respond to that? Well, that's, that's a tricky question because <clears throat> Darwin's theory is kind of a shibboleth or a, uh, an important uh, symbol, oftentimes in the culture wars in our society, so that if you just indicate that, well, you're a little skeptical of Darwin's theory, people will become hostile. You know, not everybody, but some people will mark you out as you are on the other side. And so we... Suddenly the open-mindedness vanishes. Well, it's never there in the first place. <laughs> I would recommend, first of all, that if you're going to express skepticism that you know what you're talking about. And so you have to read uh, and uh, understand the subject. You should also, going in, realize that there's a lot of loose talk when it comes to how life arose. People will say life evolved and you press them on how we know a Darwinian mechanism or random processes uh, is responsible. They'll back off. They'll say, "Well, you know, we we're still working on the mechanism of how life evolved." But hey, look, there were dinosaurs, and here's some fossil bones. <clears throat> so you have to separate the idea of evolution. You can call it mere evolution uh, from the idea of Darwin's theory. In mere evolution, by that I mean the idea of common descent, that organisms today might be related through birth and death and change from organisms in the distant past. And, but it doesn't say how in the world such fantastic things could change. It doesn't say where the ancestors came from. It pretty much says, well, yeah, then we started here, here we are now, don't know how that happened. Okay, uh, that's fine, and, and as far as I can see, that's quite compatible <coughs> with understanding the need for guidance and intelligence in developing life. Darwin's claim to fame was not to propose evolution in that sense. There were other naturalists who lived before him who had talked about evolution and the uh, ladder of life and increasing uh, uh, aspects of being and, and so forth. His, but the, with those other folks, uh, the progression of life was always teleological. There was a purpose, there was something driving and guiding it and so on, which pretty much everybody uh, understood to be God. But Darwin's claim to fame was that he thought he proposed a mechanism a mindless mechanism that just by playing out and having these accidents, mutations, and natural selection over time would, uh, could explain the very intricate features that were known even back in his day, like the, the eye with very many mechanisms and uh, it was known since antiquity that the eye was really uh, an impressive uh, feature. So that was his claim to fame. He says that these uh, systems and elegant and complex features of life 
could arise without the input of any intelligence, without any guidance, especially from God. He made it clear in his correspondence that if God had to have a role in explaining any of this, then he would care nothing for his theory. He's, so he was not, he rebuffed a couple of fellow scientists who had written letters suggesting a theistic interpretation of his mechanism that, well, yes, you know, this can happen, but of course we know that some of the random changes were actually guided by God. He said, forget about that. He says, that's not what I mean. And that's certainly not what it's taken to mean today. So <clears throat> when you go in the classroom, you have to keep in mind the distinction between different senses of the word evolution. Change over time, well, you know, duh, you know, we see change over time. Uh, common descent, well, there's evidence for that. There's problems with it, but it's not, in my view, it, it's kind of trivial because it doesn't explain anything. Where 99% of the philosophical and scientific uh, importance of Darwin's theory arises is in the claim that random changes, unguided changes, filtered by natural selection, can get the job done. And by random, we mean, again, un, uh, unguided, unplanned by anyone, including God. By the way, can you give us a, a quick synopsis of, of your latest book, Darwin yeah. Devolves? Uh, Darwin Devolves is my third book. Um, and uh, the first one was called Darwin's Black Box. It kind of described the molecular machinery of the cell or some examples of it and showed why it's resistant to Darwin's mechanism because it's irreducibly complex, can't be put together gradually, and why it's a good indication of design because the parts are arranged for purposes and we know that minds have purposes. And the other book, the second book, uh, I'll skip over that, and, but the third book, and I've written all these books as the field has advances, as biochemistry has discovered more and more about the molecular foundation of life. The third book involves the question of just what are these mutations that are involved in helpful uh, changes in organisms. It's been known for a long time that if you grow bacteria for a while, they start to grow faster and they can go better and say, oh, hey, that's, that's pretty cool. And again, I, I mentioned earlier, European travelers would come to the tropics and see that uh, the uh, folks, natives there had resistance to diseases that they, the Europeans, didn't and say, wow, you know, that's a great uh, improvement in our health. But until recently, nobody knew exactly what were the changes in DNA that underlie these uh, abilities. And uh, you have to go to that level. I, I stress in my books that you have to look at the molecular level of life because that's, the, that's where the rubber meets the road in biology. DNA is a molecule. DNA contains information in, in genes to instruct the machinery of the cell to make proteins, and essentially a, a, a code to make the proteins which are the parts of the molecular machinery of the cell. So a change in the DNA changes the instructions to make the molecular machinery, results in a different machine which can affect the shape or the uh, metabolism of an organism. So you gotta know what those changes are. And uh, it's only been in the past 20 years that uh, new laboratory equipment and new computer uh, equipment and advances in computer speeds have kind of come together to allow scientists to sequence every single unit, every single what's called nucleotides of DNA in an organism. You, 
some older folks, if you ask your parents, uh, the audience asks their parents, they might remember in the year uh, 2000 that then President Clinton and Prime Minister Tony Blair of the United Kingdom jointly announced that the entire human genome had been sequenced, and that was a huge milestone. But it took decades and billions of dollars. Well, uh, just like the earliest computers were big and clunky and expensive, but now they're really fast, really cheap, and so on. Same thing with sequencing. You know, you can sequence a human genome or somebody's genome, you know, in a day these days. And the genomes of all sorts of organisms, bacteria, bears, dogs, uh, plants, corn, uh, viruses, you name it, is a lot easier and quicker. And so you can track down changes in the DNA, and you can track down the ones, it's still hard, but you can at least do it these days, you can try, uh, track down the ones that are responsible for uh, beneficial mutations. And it turns out that the great majority of them break pre-existing genes or uh, degrade, you know, decrease their ability to do what they have done. And <clears throat> it turns out that can be beneficial in some circumstances. And uh, when I explain this to people, they ask, you know, how can it be beneficial to break something? Uh, well, and, and I say, well, you know, imagine that your car, you had a real nice car, maybe a DeLorean from, you know, Back to the Future or something, the movie Back to the Future, or a fancy car. But due to some strange circumstance, your life depended on your car getting better gas mileage. So what's the quickest way you could get better gas mileage? Well, you can take those doors and you can take them off, break them off and throw them away. And you take the hood and throw it away and spare tire, throw it out. And because of the decreased weight, now it gets better gas mileage. You know, doors and hoods and so on are useful, <laughs> uh, but if your life depended on right now getting better gas mileage, then throwing those things away is the way to go. And in the book, I show a number of examples of just that going on. And it turns out that wherever we have been able to track down mutations that seem to be responsible for changes, uh, noticeable changes, they've been degradative. There's, I, I'm sure most um, students have run across Darwin's finches, the Galapagos finches, as examples of evolution. Uh, everybody knows they, you know, there's about a dozen different species of them on these islands, the Galapagos Islands, which are about 500 miles west of Ecuador. And the idea that, uh, is that maybe sometime in the misty past, a couple of finches were blown by a storm or something out onto these islands. They, you know, kind of liked it there and they settled down and they divided into species over a couple million years. Hmm. That's interesting. And, uh, but and some of them are, you know, larger than others, maybe twice the size. Some have thinner beaks, some have thicker beaks, and uh, they eat different food and so on. Well, it was about five years or so ago, a Swedish team went down there and they got blood samples from the birds from each of the species, uh, each of the 12 species, and they sequenced the entire genome. And the genome of the bird is roughly about a, a billion nucleotides. So they sequenced, I think it was actually, a, they had a hundred samples from the bird, so they had a hundred billion, you know, nucleotides worth of sequence. And so you can't, you know, do this by hand. You have to enter the data into computers and use computers to compare things. But the long and the short is that um, the 
difference between the sharp-beaked birds and the blunt-beaked finches uh, is that there is a gene in the blunt-beaked ones which is broken or degraded, can't work as well as it used to. How does that help? Well, if, if there's a gene that is, helps control facial development, and in birds it helps a beak grow long and thin, well, if you break it, maybe the beak will be, you know, shorter and thicker, doesn't achieve the same shape that it did before. And maybe that helps. For example, in the drought, these big beaked birds uh, could eat tougher seeds that survived the drought and the other ones couldn't and died. Maybe that does help, uh, but it doesn't explain how you get the gene in the first place. It doesn't explain how you build things in the first place. So this book essentially says that, yeah, all of these examples, or many of them, uh, are true, but they're the result of devolution rather than evolution, breaking stuff that's already there rather than making stuff. But nobody cares about how you can break genes. <laughs> the question about how life diversified and you know uh, achieved all of uh, all of the fantastic things that we see is how you can construct it in the first place. So there had to have been a prototype. Would, would you? Yeah, is that the that, right, that's right. Like a prototype that <laughs> then gave rise to variations within exactly. a prototype. Exactly. Turns out that if you start with a generic finch, you know, somewhere in the forests of South America, well, maybe, you know, if it gets blown this way and it finds itself in a different environment, maybe it can lose some traits. And by losing them, it helps adapt it to that specific environment. So you lose a gene that makes your beak longer and thinner, but now you can uh, survive in a tougher environment. Uh, if you lose a different set of genes, maybe you'll grow bigger. Maybe the controls that tell your growing body to stop growing, uh, maybe they get damaged and they get bigger. And uh, I talk about a, a number of examples of dog breeds, which are oftentimes pointed at by evolutionists saying, you know, look at, you know, what selective breeding has wrought in just a couple hundred years. Uh, and, uh, but in the past 10 years, a lot of scientists were interested in these dog breeds too, simply because they wanted to say what genes are involved in the differences between dachshunds and Great Danes and, and so on. The great majority of ones are broken genes. So if you want a, a chihuahua, you can break the genes that help legs grow longer and bodies grow bigger. And there are dogs that are really thickly muscled, and that's due to the breaking of a control gene called myostatin that tells the body when to stop growing muscles. And uh, dogs that have different fur colors. They're generally broken genes uh, involved in that. You can't make a pigment anymore. And if you think about it, you know, that's an, a wonderful example of evolution because if in the wild some circumstances said, well, shorter-legged dogs would have an advantage over here, the quickest way to get short legs would be to break the gene that you know makes your legs longer, uh, rather than try to wait for a new machine which would somehow do the same thing. Because it, of course, takes a lot longer to build something that's invariably going to have a lot of parts than just to break something. And if um, in another circumstance it says, well, let's get a really big dog, uh, you can break the controls that tell it when to stop growing. So you can really uh, guide the development of organisms in a number of different directions by breaking stuff they already have rather than uh, making new stuff. 
So I, in my estimation, that's, this is the death knell of Darwin's theory. Uh, uh, simply because it shows that, yeah, this random mutation and natural selection is real. You know, it certainly is true, and it operates on genes. But just statistically, it's a lot easier and faster to break a gene than to make one. And by doing so, you can change an organism in a lot of different ways, uh, which would likely be compatible with a new environment or successful in a new environment. So Darwin's mechanism itself is powerfully devolutionary. You know, who would have thought it, you know, uh, <laughs> back, back in the day. But yeah, Darwin's, Darwin's mechanism itself degrades the genome over time. So it is not the answer to the question of where did all this amazing stuff come from in the first place. So I think it's, it's safe to say that it's okay to doubt Darwin, that the death knell has been sounded, <laughs> that Darwin's theory is outdated and inadequate. That's correct. Uh, as a matter of fact, a, a little known fact, you know, wh whenever you read about evolution in the newspapers or see it on TV shows, they always talk about Darwin's mechanism. But Darwin's ideas are kind of out of favor in the biology community as a whole these days. I, I, I would estimate that, you know, one quarter to one third of biologists themselves don't think Darwin's theory is the complete answer. And other people have been proposing other factors which might have affected the development of life. And the name for this is called the extended evolutionary synthesis. Um, and uh, I won't go into it, but uh, in my book, Darwin Devolves, I have a couple chapters discussing these other mechanisms, and they explain a thing or two here or there, but they are not the overarching explanation that is needed to, uh, to uh, ex explain the development of life. So for uh, somebody who's not in the field, you're in good company if you doubt Darwin's <laughs> theory. And if you just say, I doubt Darwin's theory, I think there must be something else, you'll do fine in uh, academia. The, the third rail or the dividing line between permissible and impermissible thinking is if you say, I think intelligence was required. I think something, you know, else, not randomness, but, uh, you know, intelligence was behind the development of life. And that that is the dividing line. So uh, plenty of people criticize Darwin's theory, but uh, intelligent design is still viewed as beyond the pale in academia, even though you know you talk to the man on the street and everybody, everybody thinks that's that's right. the case. This took a designer and an intelligence. <laughs> the creator of the universe has to, has to be a master designer. It's so complex. You, you bet. Yeah, and the more the key is the more science knows, the more stunningly obvious that becomes. Back when a lot less was known about life or the universe, people, scientists thought it wasn't all that big of a deal. Back in Darwin's day, not only did people not know about molecules and cells, but physicists and astronomers thought that the universe was eternal and that it was kind of bland and that the earth was no big deal and there's probably life on every other planet you know around because hey it would arise by a darwinian process anyway so the more we know the more physics and astronomy has advanced the more we see that the universe as a whole is fine-tuned stunningly fine-tuned for life and the more we know about biology the more we see the uh, amazing complexity and intricacy uh, and purpose in all of the parts of life uh, starting from the foundation of life. So unlike the, you know, the uh, popular misconception, the more science knows, the more that 
it points to the need for a cause beyond the material universe for an explanation of what we find uh, in the universe. And therefore it makes a lot of sense to believe that God created everything. Absolutely. <laughs> that's certainly what I think. And that's what, you know, Thomas Aquinas and, and all the uh, fathers of the church and, and so on said. They say, hey, look, a living system, it's, it's like a, uh, a boat being made by a master builder, but it's even better because the, the uh, instructions or the ability is, is within the body of the, of the organism itself. And so uh, Aquinas likened life to design stuff and the, the need for a mind to put it all together.